So after Mikolov proposed the initial skipgram model, in that same year actually, they followed that up with another paper to address one of the shortcomings um, that you often have to deal with with skipgram. So in the basic standard skipgram model, we are modeling the probability of some context word given a center word according to this softmax-like um, function where you take the dot product of the word embedding of the context word with the word embedding of the center word and then you're normalizing that by summing up over all of the um, exponentiated to dot products of all the words in the vocabulary. Now the problem is that the vocabulary, this V, can actually be uh, like very very big. So you might have in a smallish NLP system you can maybe have 50,000 words in your vocabulary and now every time you need to calculate this um, value year, you need to sum up over the dot product of 50,000 things. And so this um, summation can actually be quite painful to do computationally. So the extension that, um, that they proposed for Skipgram is to use Skipgram with what they call negative sampling. And this is actually quite a general idea within machine learning, and I will touch on that in a, in a second. But basically what you do is instead of trying to basically, you know, over this vector of vocabulary, get the dot product of the one item that you're interested in to get that dot product high. Instead of doing that, you actually f um, change the problem into a binary logistic regression task. And if you're not that familiar with binary logistic regression, please check out the other series of um, videos that I have. But I will recap it so that it's also self-contained in this little video. But the basic idea is that you're going to train a model which doesn't give you the probability of a context word given a center word. No. Instead of that, you're going to train a model that outputs ones and zeros, basically. And you want the model to output a high value, a value close to one, a probability of one, when the center word is paired with some context word occurring in its context window. Okay, so C and O are words that we see in, in the window um, when we're making a pass over our training data. And you want the same model to output a value close to zero when the center word C is paired with a randomly sampled word um, K that doesn't occur in this context window that you're looking at at the moment. Okay, so you basically, instead of trying to output this huge probability vector over all the words in my vocabulary, because that's really what, what you need to do here, instead of doing that, the model, you can think of it in that this way, is just outputting a value between 0 or 1 for whether this specific center word occurs with this context word. Cool. I hope that makes um, that makes sense. So let's see what the model um, actually looks like. The model now becomes a function that outputs a value between 0 and 1 for whether a particular context word occurs with a particular center word. Okay, so you want your model to output values close to 1 if these two actually occur together in a context window. And you want your model to output a value close to 0 when these don't occur together in a, in a context window. And the way that we're going to structure this model, how we go from the inputs to the outputs, and now really the inputs are the center word and the context word, and you get a value between 0 and 1. The structure of the model in this case is we're still going to rely on the dot product between the context word embedding and the center word embedding. But now what we're going to do is we're going to take the dot product between them and then we're going to squash that dot product using the sigmoid function. So let's just unpack that a little bit. Um, if you go through the binary logistic regression video, the sigmoid function starts out, if you have a very large negative value of a, it starts out close to zero. And then as it approaches a of zero, it um, goes to a half and then it flattens out again to a value that's um, approaching 1 as A gets very, very big. So at A infinity, then um, the sigmoid of A reaches the value 1.
So basically what we're doing now is we're taking the dot product between the context word embedding and the center word embedding. And we say that if this product is very, if the dot product is very, very large, then we're on this like extreme end of the sigmoid function. And then we will output a value close to one saying that yes, this context word with this center word, they do occur together. If however, the dot product is a very, very large negative number somewhere here, then we would output, when we push it through the sigmoid, we would output a value close to zero, which basically says, listen, this context word doesn't occur with this um, center word. Okay, the probability of them occurring together is close to zero. And that's the model structure that we use when we do skip gram with negative sampling. What does the loss function look like? So again, we're going to train this model with um, negative log likelihood. And if we just consider one um, context pair, so we have a center word and a context word, then um, we can write, just for this pair, we can uh, write the contribution to this loss function, j as jco for that pair. Um, we've got parameters theta, which the, the thetas are again the combination of all the context word embeddings and all the center word embeddings. We are going to minimize the negative of the log of the likelihood which if we only have one pair, um, it's just this probability that we wrote down here at the top. If we've observed in our training data, the CNO, we can just substitute that particular observation for CNO. We take the dot product, we take the sigmoid, and then for the loss function, we take the negative log of this value. That is the estimated probability that um, C and O occur together within a context window. Cool. Looks pretty nice. Actually, the loss function looks almost simpler than we, we had when we just had um, the normal skip gram model. But the problem is if you only do this, um, then we've actually got an easy way to hack the loss function because we're just training on one positive pair and we don't have any negative examples. You can actually get this loss function very close to zero. Okay, so how would you do this? You would just make the word embeddings for the context words and for the center words, you just make them very, very, very big. Okay, so you just have big positive numbers, for instance. And then when you're taking the dot product between two big things, then hopefully you end up with a big number. Um, and then you've got the sigmoid of a big number, which is close to one, and you've got the log of one, which is close to zero. And that is the lowest that we can get this loss. Okay. So that makes us a little bit sad. And I mean, this is just standard machine learning. You can't just train on positive examples. You also need negative examples. Otherwise you do end up by just hacking your loss function in some non-sensible way. To fix this, you need some negative examples. I guess it was in the, in the title already, you know, skip gram with negative sampling. So what we do is that for each pair of center word with context word, we're also going to sample capital K words that does not occur in this context window of the center word. Okay. And I'll just denote it like this. We sample W little K um, from our data. We have some training data and from the training data, we randomly sample some of these negative words while making sure that they don't occur in the context window that we're currently considering. So now the binary logistic regression task is basically that I've observed a little data set. The data contains a positive pair of C and O and then capital K negative terms, um, capital K negative examples where um, we have words WK that doesn't occur with this specific center word C. Okay. And we basically take the negative log likelihood of this little data set given that we know the positive word and the negative words. Okay, so what does that mean? It means I'm going to take the negative of the log of the likelihood of the parameters, which in this case um, is a product over the positive um, probability. And then we're going to multiply that with all the negative um, examples as well. So um, the positive labeled one has this specific center word with this specific context word, this pair is labeled with the label one saying that yes, they do occur together. And then we're going to multiply that with the probability of 
our first negative item, which is labeled with the label saying that these two things do not occur together. So we've got this specific center word, and then we've got this um, context word, uh, W1. That's the first word that we, the first negative word that we sampled here. And then we multiply this. And then our second negatively labeled example. So we've got our center word and then this second um, negative um, sampled word. Okay, and you can you, you get the idea you do this for all the terms and you end with the last one that's labeled as a negative W capital K here. That's our last sampled word. Okay, and we take the log of that monstrosity. Now, if you go back, then this would just be the sigmoid of the dot product of the context word O with the center word C. Okay, and that gives us the probability that these two things occur together. Okay, for this term here, we are also going to take the dot product between the center word and the context word, so that's now uh, W1, okay, and we also take the dot product. We also take the sigmoid, okay, and this gives us the probability that these two things occur together with a probability of one there, okay, but we want the probability that they're negative examples, so we go one minus this. Cool, I hope that makes sense. So this term, sigmoid there, this term, you take the dot product, um, but you do one minus this because you want the probability um, that these two things do not occur together in the same context window, and that is um, what you have there. Okay, so we can write this out um, a little bit more, maybe compactly. So we've got negative log, okay, and then we've got the sigmoid times, and then we've got a massive product here over a little k equal to one up to big K, and these are our negative sampled words. And for each of them, we have one minus the sigmoid of the dot product of u, w, little k, transpose um, vc, that's the dot product. Now, the cool thing about logs, the log of a product turns into the sum of the logs. So you're basically going to sum up negative log of this, with the sum of negative log of this product. And then this product again, because you're taking the log of the product, that again turns into the sum of the logs. Okay, I'm going over this relatively quickly, but you've seen this a million times now. And so you can write this thing as this, where you have negative log of that first term, and then minus um, the sum of the logs of all of those terms, and you end up with this expression. There's a little identity with sigmoids that you can also use to um, write this even more compactly. And that is that one minus the sigmoid of A is the same as sig sigmoid minus A. Okay, so that's even a more compact form for the last term corresponding to this particular pair of a center word and context word. You would then, the complete loss would be constructed by having obviously uh, the sum over all the, the possible um, center word context word pairs in your um, in your data set exactly like we had um, before. Cool, I hope this makes sense. Now the nice thing is here we still have a summation but we don't have to sum over capital V different words. We only have to calculate this loss function over the, the capital K sampled words. Right, you can see that in this loss function, what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and make U and V similar so that they have a, a nice big um, dot product here. But then at the same time, I'm going to make sure that negative examples of um, U and V are far from each other in order to get this thing to be big. So these two, if I take the dot product, I want a large negative number. And uh, let me just circle this. I want a large negative number for that, because if I have a large negative number here, then I will take negative of that, okay? Which would give me a very large positive number so that this thing is big, and because I'm negative there, then I'm pushing the loss down, okay? And there was a lot of negatives and stuff there. The point is that if you look at this loss function, I want um, the 
context word embedding and the center word embedding to be similar to each other, while I want the center word embedding and negative context word embeddings to be far from each other, to have a low dot product. And if you do that, then you get a low value for your loss function. Now, this actually corresponds to a more general idea within machine learning called contrastive learning, where the goal is to um, push together observations that occur close to each other, in this case, my context word and my center word, I want to push those things together so that they have similar representations, um, while at the same time pushing away, for instance, my center word from negative samples that doesn't occur in the current vicinity that I'm looking at. And this is a general idea in machine learning, um, models like contrastive predictive coding, um, if you've heard about that, it, it also relies on this basic principle of pushing together things that are close to each other, while at the same time pushing away things that doesn't occur in this um, current vicinity.